Energy Matters Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to discuss and explore some specific topics about the energy industry in general and the oil and gas in specific, while covering some related topics in environment, economics, policy, and many more. How are you everyone and welcome to Texas A&M University, Society of Petroleum Engineers, Damo SPE, Energy Matters Podcast. My name is Kasim Alokla, the president of the chapter and also your host on today's episode featuring Mr. Tim Tarpley, the president of Energy Workforce and Technology Council. On today's episode, we are going to focus and talk a little bit about what does it take to elevate the energy sector in United States. So before we start, I will go over the bio of Mr. Tarpley, and then we will just begin our podcast. As the president of Energy Workforce, uh, Tim oversees policy, government affairs, international trade policy, ESG, and environmental policy, developing and implementing an integrated strategic plan to advance the energy workforce policy positions and broaden the awareness for its programs and priorities and increase the visibility of its positions uh, for key stakeholders' audiences. Tarpley has advocated for the men and women of the United States energy industry for the past five years in Washington and around the country. He has presented at multiple conferences. Uh, prior to joining the Energy Workforce and Technology Council, he served as the Chief of Staff to Congressman Ted Poe and began his legislative uh, career as an aide to Congressman Thornberry as a lunchman for the Congressman uh, Poe's staff for more than nine years. Tim worked on permitting and uh, the Keystone Pipeline, ending the crude oil uh, export ban and streaming uh, the permitting of the LNG export approval. Uh, Tarpley holds a Juris Doctor from the Creighton University School of Law and an LLM from the American University uh, Washington College of Law. So let's get started. Tim, thank you for joining. It's really a great pleasure for us. So thank you again for this opportunity. We really appreciate your presence today. Glad to, glad to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So let's start with your uh, experience and education maybe. So please uh, tell us more about yourself. How did you end up in the oil and gas industry? What made you interested in the oil and gas? This is our first time having a lawyer or a non-engineer. So it's <laughs> going to be a great uh, discussion today. So yeah, uh, please tell us more about yourself too. Sure. So uh, I'll try to stay away from too much legalese, but um, I mean, really my, my career has always been policy focused. Um, starting after I graduated law school, I was hired on uh, as legislative counsel for for Mac Thornberry, who was a former member of Congress from uh, the north part of Texas, Amarillo, Wichita Falls area. He was on um, he was on uh, the Armed Services Committee. Uh, he ultimately became chairman of that committee. And when he hired me, it was during the period um, uh, during the the Iraq conflict. And there was a lot of legal issues with regard to detainees uh, on the committee. So he hired me really to do that and then uh, pick up some other issues as well. Uh, so I spent about four years with him, ultimately got hired then to be legislative director for Congressman Poe, who represented where I grew up, um, which is in Kingwood, Texas, just uh, just outside of Houston. And uh, so I ended up working for him for almost almost a decade, you know, started as legislative director, then became his deputy chief of staff, and then ultimately his chief of staff and stayed with him till he uh, till he retired in uh, in 2018. Um, and then the second part of your question was, um, well, let me let me back up, actually. So, I mean, most of my time spent on Capitol Hill was actually writing legislation um, that and, and and trying to push that legislation and get it passed. So that's really what I spent most of those years doing. Uh, we had a lot of successes, you know, certainly on the energy side, um, a lot of those uh, uh, initiatives that you mentioned. Um, Congressman Poe was also very much involved in the fight against human trafficking. And we were successfully passed a couple pieces of legislation, including the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act during that period. So that was probably my, you know, my most proud moment was when we passed that, that bill on, on the floor. So I got to do a lot of really, uh, really interesting things. A lot of, um, um, you know, things that were really a great opportunity for, for you know, starting out in my career. As far as the, um, you know, the interest in the energy 
industry, the energy uh, energy policy. I mean, I've always had that. I grew up in Houston, Texas. My dad was it was in oil and gas, and then in renewables. Most of my friends, um, you know, their their parents were, you know, at least one of them was involved in oil and gas to some extent. Uh, in fact, where I grew up, Kingwood was was originally built by uh, Exxon. You know, it was built for uh, to house Exxon workers. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up with energy kind of in my blood. Um, but, you know, then on the Hill, certainly the district we represented energy was very important. So I spent a lot of time on policy. Um, Congressman Poe was on uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee. He, he was chairman of the Trade Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs, which oversaw um, LNG exports. You know, a lot of the issues around LNG exports, um, specifically, uh, you know, exports that involved uh, free trade agreements with other countries. So, you know, spent a lot of time traveling, going, um, you know, speaking to our, our friends in Eastern Europe and other places in India who really wanted American LNG. Um, and, we, you know, we worked to figure out how to do that. Um, and this this was back, you know, uh, seven and eight years ago before before LNG kind of became the, the, the hot topic that it was now. This was kind of at the beginning of that um, that resurgence. So um, really got involved in energy policy there, worked a lot on the Keystone Pipeline as well. So when Congressman Poe retired in 18, um, I, you know, I was really looking primarily in energy because I wanted to, you know, move full time back to Houston. Uh, you know, I, I did look a little bit in some other sectors, but I was primarily focused on on, on energy because it was really was going to get me where I wanted. Thank you, Tim, for sharing your uh, background. It's really interesting and a lot of good stuff here. So thank you. Uh, now let's move to EWTC. You guys are really doing a great job. I'm always uh, following you on LinkedIn. So you're very active. Um, you go everywhere. You participate in almost every conference. So it's really interesting. So for those who are not familiar with EWTC, could you please tell us more about uh, EWC, EWTC Energy Workforce uh, Technology Council and what, what do you do? Uh, like as an association, what what's your mission and what's your impact in the oil and gas industry or the energy industry in general, maybe? Sure, happy to. So we're, we're uh, our name is new, but the association is actually quite old. So Energy Workforce and Technology Council is a result of a merger between two, two very old energy trade associations, PISA and AESC. PISA was actually founded in 1933 uh, it helped write the U.S. Oil Code. Um, it was it was formed for that reason, and it's been a trade association since then. AESC was founded in 1956. We merged those two um, uh, in, in the beginning of 2021. So now we have a na the National Trade Association for the Energy Services and Equipment Sector. So that's about 350 companies, uh, you know, that operate all over all over the world, all over the United States, and all over the world. Um, the biggest companies, you know, the names that that you're going to recognize are going to be, you know, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, NOV, SLB, uh, you know, some of the really, really leading companies in the energy space. They're all our members. Uh, and the thing that that probably makes me the most proud to get up in the morning and do this job is we, we represent the workforce uh, of the of the energy sector. Six hundred and fifty thousand U.S. jobs uh, are represented by this sector. So these are men and women all over the country and in every state that build equipment that's used to produce the energy that this country and the world needs um, uh, in every state. And, you know, we, 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 we track all of that data um, where, where all these jobs are located and, uh, and provide that to, you know, members of Congress, governors, whoever needs it to really show the really how diverse this energy sector is. Um, so that's really who we are. We do all, uh, as far as what we do, we certainly advocate and speak for the sector, speak for those jobs, speak for those people. Um, but we also provide services to our member companies, you know, that a typical trade association we do. We do workforce training, uh, we, you know, um, executive training, field ops training, we provide training on things like ESG um, to our member companies. Um, so, you know, we kind of have those two buckets of what we do as a trade association, the outward speaking, you know, on behalf of the sector, as well as the work we do for our companies that we provide. That's that's really interesting. So yeah, I saw a lot of um, posts about these trainings. So are these trainings available like only for professionals or maybe um, young professionals, students can be enrolled in these trainings? 
So could you please tell yeah, us about them? Gr great question. So it's across the gamut. Um, you know, if if uh, if a member, if an individual works for one of our member companies, they have the ability to, to um, sign up for any of the trainings that they would want. We have trainings geared towards, you know, folks that work in the field, um, you know, our field operations training. But we also have just a basic oil and gas course, oil and gas 101, where new, we generally new hires into the industry maybe, have, you know, have just started working at a company within the, in the past year. We give them the whole rundown of uh of the industry of of the technology of, of of really how things work um so that's a great program we do that we do that all uh twice a year we, we teach that course um interestingly enough we also teach and this is another thing that, that we're really proud of I'm, I'm specifically proud of is every year we have a contract with the state department for two trainings where we train foreign service officers that um are about to get deployed or have already been deployed to locations where energy is going to be a big issue that they deal with, we we train them, um, you know, uh, uh, with a week long course here in Houston, actually, where we we bring them to a number of member company facilities and we really teach them about the energy industry, um, oil and gas, and, and as well as new technologies. And then they take that knowledge and those skills that they learn and they they can use that in their new post um, wherever that is in the world. So really proud of that as well. Yeah, that that's really cool, and yeah, we motivate everyone who's watching this one, uh, this podcast, to enroll in these uh, trainings or courses. It's really beneficial. Um, today, the debate is about the energy industry. How sustainable is um, this industry? What's the uh, incoming future for our industry, or specifically the oil and gas? So, based on your position as the president of EWTC. What do you think uh, the future of EWTC will be in the next five years, 10 years from now? Yeah, great question. So, I, um, you know, I personally am very bullish on, on the energy industry as a whole, and I'll explain to you why. I mean, the bottom line is energy demand is going to increase by 25% in the next 20 years. That's worldwide. That energy demand is going um, to be across the board. We are going to need all forms of energy. It's not going to be, oh, we only need re renewables. We only need oil and gas. We're going to need everything. We're going to need everything we can produce. And absent, you know, some sort of uh, kind of unexpected technological development that maybe we're not seeing, uh, anticipating, all forms of energy are going to be needed for that that period and even in, in, into, you know, 30 and 40 years forward. We are seeing... You know, many areas of the world, places like India and Southeast Asia, um, even, you know, demand is going to continue to increase in China, obviously, uh, Africa. These folks are starting to get into the middle class. They are they are really demanding uh, the quality of life that we've seen here in the West. And really what you need to give those folks that ability, that op that that opportunity is is energy. Um, and it needs to be affordable. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be consistent. Uh, and in many many ways, it needs to be portable, meaning, meaning you need to get be able to get it to where the people the people are. And you know, right now, I think oil and gas are going to remain a big part of that. Uh, renewables are going to be a huge part of that too, solar and wind as, as well. Um, you know, new new technologies like geothermal, hydrogen also have uh, you know huge opportunities. Uh, you know, with, with with some of those, the technology and the supply chains might not be quite there yet, but but certainly. As those come online, we will see those those technologies taking a bigger percentage of the total energy space. But when you're, it's it's like a piece of pie. When you when the pie is getting bigger, <laughs> even if even if, if if percentages are changing in there, the demand you know for for all of that is still going to be more. And that's really that's really what what we see. Um, our companies, companies we represent, you know they they are still primarily. Um, making uh, a significant, you know, portion of of their revenues and is on oil and gas, but they are investing significantly in new technologies like hydrogen, uh, CCS, um, you know, wind and solar. They're they're investing heavily in that, and as those technologies grow, you know, I think our companies, the percentages of what they work on, will include some of the, a lot of that new technologies. It'll be a higher percentage of what they do, but. Um, 
you know, that's kind of, so that's kind of what we see. So, you know, we are, when we, when we're talking, you know, to, to um, U.S. government, other governments, I mean, that's the story we tell. Um, the, the story we tell is we're, that we're really looking at an energy expansion. It's not going to necessarily be a transition from one form of energy to the other. It's going to be really, we need more of all forms of energy. Our companies are, are poised to deliver that. And that's really the message that, that we're sending. Exactly. Exactly. That's true. We are, all of us, like, are advocating for energy mix, not for energy transition. And this right. is important to clarify. <laughs> all right. Um, so you guys are in a good relationship with the administration and the Congress. You are always attending a um, lot of conferences there. So could you please tell us more how do you engage, how EWTC uh, engage with the administration and the Congress? Sure. Um, and that's that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's a lot of what we do. So... Um, I'll, I'll start with with the administration side first, you know, because our engagement, um, you know, with the administration is obviously going to depend on, on on who's in who's in control. You know, we've seen on at least on energy policy, we've seen some significant shifts between you know the last administration and this administration. So really, what we wanted to do is we wanted to tell a consistent message, uh, and the message is really what I just I just told you is that um, you know our our member companies are. Um, going to be part of of the energy mix for many years to come and that they they're going to provide the technology uh to get us to you know where our energy mix is going to be in 10 20 years but um especially with 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 this administration and really with any administration we want to tell the story of those 650,000 workers um that are all over the united states because um they're a big part of the economy uh, and they're a, they're a resource for us. The technology and expertise that those folks have is a tremendous resource for the United States. I mean, it is no surprise that wherever in the world, when they find oil and gas, uh, you know, nine times out of ten, it's it's the U.S. companies they call to come, you, you know, pr produce it. It's, it's U.S. Um, expertise, and we're we're exporting that all over the world, and that's that's a great thing. So we want to tell the story of those of those men and women, what they do. And how important they are to to the United States. Uh, as far as Congress goes, um, our 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 advocacy is is similar, but maybe a little bit more nuanced. Um, we want to again tell the story of those men and women where they are. We want to let every member of Congress know uh, that the, the 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 how many folks from the energy workforce are in their congressional districts. Um, and we want to obviously advocate for policies that are going to support, you know, growth in, in that in that industrial sector. We uh, that advocacy, on, on, you know, looks like a lot of different things. We bring uh, every year, uh, at least once, sometimes twice. We bring executives and, uh, and 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 members of our companies up to to Washington D.C. so they can meet with the individuals that represent the districts where they have, uh, you know, con you know, facilities and, and workers. Um, that's a real big uh, part of our advocacy. Certainly, we have you know a team of of three that focus on policy and advocacy. We're constantly going to Washington, testifying in hearings, meeting with members. We're going to state capitals. In fact, I was in Austin earlier this week. Um, you know, working on the state side. States we focus on are obviously the states where we have the most uh, most most facilities, most workers, which is going to be you know Texas, Oklahoma, the Dakotas, Louisiana, Colorado. Um, California, you know, in the United States. And then we do a little bit of, of international advocacy as well in places where our, our companies, uh, you know, operate Latin America and the Middle East. Uh, it's a smaller part of what we do, but uh, that is a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but primarily we were focused on, you know, U.S. US government. That, that's really interesting. We will focus more about the energy mix later on um, in our conversation. But now I want to focus or like shed light on your career at EWTC. So you recently joined EWTC and I think you also like this year uh, joined uh, the company as the president, if I'm not wrong. So how did you start with EWTC and how did you get into your position as the president? Okay, so yeah, good, good question. So actually, um, so I worked for PISA starting in 2018 mm -hmm. uh, as as Vice President of Government Affairs. When PISA um, merged with AESC, we created the Energy Workforce in, in 2021. Um, I then continued on and um, took over as as Senior Vice President of the new of the new organization. Our 
CEO Leslie Beyer, who I'm sure a, lo a lot of uh, folks listening to this know. She's great. She's wonderful. She's a, a great spokesman for uh, for the, en the energy industry as a whole, for, for, for uh, women in energy. I mean, she's been incredible. She is um, leaving us here in, in a few months, in, in July, actually. So um, uh, myself, as well as Molly Dieterman, uh, are going to take over the association after, you know, running the association after she leaves. So um, that's kind of how, how that all worked out. So we're in, we're in a moment of transition right now um, as, as Leslie, you know, wraps up and leaves us in July. Um, so that's kind of how, how that all worked out. That's cool. Yeah, shout out to Leslie. She's the one who recommended you. So thank you, Leslie. Uh, right. Yeah, she's she's great. She's great. We'll, we will miss her, but she will be, I'm sure, advocating for for energy in some capacity going forward. So I'm I'm uh, looking forward to seeing what she does next. Sure, sure. All right, let's new, move now to the next part of the uh, podcast today, which is the topic of this uh, uh, discussion: elevating the energy sector. So, currently, we know that there is a big debate regarding the energy industry, especially the oil and gas. So, all over the world, we are hearing topics such as energy transition, energy addition, energy evolution, as you mentioned today. Uh, so, what's your opinion on the on this? You previously mentioned that we need the whole pie. We need a mix of oil and gas, renewables, hydrogen, geothermal, CCS. What can, could you please tell us more about this? Um, elaborate more about the idea of energy security. Also, we there are two important terms here: energy security, and on the opposite side is sustainability. How can we achieve a balance if it can be achieved? How can the oil and gas industry play a role in achieving the balance between the energy security and sustainability? I know that I asked a lot of questions, but all <laughs> of them revolve around the same idea. No, I think it's a great. A, gr a, gr a great, great series of questions, and it really is is the framework that is is changed the whole energy debate. I, in my my opinion, it, you know, things have changed significantly in the past year. Um, before, and, I, and I'm just, I'm not talking about trade as a whole. I'm I'm just going to talk about energy right now. You know, but you know, before a year ago, there was kind of a perception that. Um, that really all that mattered was the energy transition. And that was the focus of, of most discussions around energy was really the energy transition. Then Russia invaded Ukraine, which was, you know, maybe some would argue wasn't as unexpected as it maybe was for me. I, I thought it was very unexpected. It was, it was not something that a lot of people predicted they would actually do, but it threw the, the really the entire world had to reevaluate what energy meant to them. Um, you had folks in in Germany that were, you know, significantly reliant on on Russian gas. All of a sudden, you know, they they had to figure out how to power their economy and and, and how to keep the lights going. On all of a sudden, so I, I think it really made um, a lot of politicians around the world reevaluate um, their energy policy, and they were and really come come around to deciding that energy security is really the primary factor. You got to have. A stable energy supply um, uh -huh. and power your economy, and it has to be affordable, affordable, reliable. Reliable is the key, uh, and prefer preferably it has to be you know produced domestically or at least if you can't do that, at least produced by your close allies in stable countries that that you know you don't have to worry about um, some unexpected event like like the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so with, with that in mind, I think it has changed, it has caused folks to reevaluate a lot of things, um, on the renewable side. I certainly am a big, very bullish on renewables, wind and solar. I think are going to be an increasing percentage, uh, of, of the U S and world energy mix. However, it has really made folks reevaluate. Okay. Well, if we're going to um, increase our, our solar use in the United States, where does that supply chain come from? And, you know, specifically with solar, unfortunately, a lot of it comes from places that are not stable. Come, a lot of it has come from China, you know, as far as the panels go. Um, and, and, and a lot of the rare critical minerals are actually coming from, you know, places in Africa that maybe aren't that stable. So it's causing folks to really reevaluate those supply chains. Um, on the oil and gas side, 
certainly, you know, U.S. LNG has all of a sudden become uh, incredibly valuable um, around the world. I mean, not not just on a price, but being able to get those contracts because, you know, folks in Eastern Europe are now asking themselves, OK, maybe we have to pay a little bit more to get U.S. gas, but it's going to be stable. We're not going to be reliant on Russia. Uh, let's make the investment now to do what we got to do to get to get that gas, you know, uh, long term. Uh, and our folks, you know, folks in in, in Asia are, are doing the same thing, and and they're looking at U.S. gas as a stable long term investment that can, uh, you know, that can buffer against some of the you know uncertainty that's going on in the world. So, what does that mean for us here in the United States? Well, I think it is. It is a good thing. It is a good thing when the United States can produce more energy here. It's good for our workforce. It's good for our economy. It's also good for our national security because it's not, you know, this is my opinion. Um, it's, it's better for us to have our friends in places like Europe and Asia, um, you know, purchasing our, our energy and, and, and working out long term contracts with us than having them have to go to, you know, folk, folks like Russia. Uh, to get their energy, because the Russians are going to use that energy uh, supply as a leverage over their politics. They've done it. They've done it before, and they're going to continue to do it again. So um, it's certainly, I, I would argue, in, in our national security interest, as well as that of our allies. So if anything good can come from kind of this shakeup in, 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 in the world markets, I think it's that the U.S. is it's been kind of a reminder to the world that you need a stable partner. The U.S. is is that stable partner, um, and I think it's good for you know folks that work work in the energy space here here in the United States. So we're bullish we're bullish on on the markets. We're bullish on certainly on U.S. gas, but also on on U.S. oil. I mean, we think there's there's really opportunities uh, for both. Um, we're also excited in that, you know, a lot of our companies now have some, some more revenue coming in and they're able to, to make reinvestments in new technology, things like CCS, hydrogen. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of, of investment going into that. We can talk a little bit more about that later. But um, so we're really excited on, on both of those, both of those fronts. Um, you know, so we're looking, we're looking forward to the coming years and, and how this all shakes out. Um, you know, especially if the economy stays stays going the way it is, and we don't face like a recession either in the United States or, or Europe. You know, we're really bullish about uh, the markets in the next couple of years. All right, perfect, perfect. Um, like 2022, I think 2023 as well has been good so far in terms like of job opportunities. For example, here at university, most of our students are getting jobs, are getting internships, and all and gas. Do you think, um, like after the pandemic, um, things started to uh, flourish again, or is it just like the demand of energy is increasing? That's why we need more jobs. So, what's what's your opinion on this? Like, I think it's something that's really interesting. But of course, we will always remember that we will have downturns in the future. So it's a cycle. Uh, we'll have upturns, downturns, but so far so good. So. What's your opinion on 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 this specific? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, um, monitoring the workforce is something we do every month. We put out a jobs report mm -hmm. um, on on in the in the, in the sector, and, and it's always it's been going up fair almost every month consistently post pandemic. We're right right around six hundred and fifty thousand right now, which is still slightly below pre-pandemic levels, but it's in, it's inching up towards towards where we were, you know, pre-pandemic. So that, that's that's a good news. Um, talent is a critical issue, though. I will say if we sat down with, um, you know, the majority of our of our companies, companies that are our members and said, OK, what's your number one issue you think in the next five years? Talent's going to be at least number one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, it's recruiting quality candidates in filling these positions. And this is across the board. It's folks that are out working rigs, you know, that are doing primarily manual labor, but it's also folks that are, you know, maybe doing high tech work um, in, in in a lab or, or, or in a, um, you know, an operational facility or manufacturing facility. So it is across the board. And there's a couple of reasons for, for that. One, you have a lot of early retirements um, in the pandemic. The, our, our workforce tends to be on the older side um, so you had folks that maybe decided to retire a little bit early. You have folks that have simply left the energy space. 
you know, have gotten frustrated with the kind of ups and downs of, of, of the sector, which have, it's always been that way, but, and then it just decided to go into another space, another, you know, take their talents to go to another sector. Uh, but then you also have competition. Um, post pandemic, you know, the, the economic recovery was so quick. There was such a demand for workers. You know, we saw competition from the transportation sector, construction, you know, pretty much everything. The tech is 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 going out and trying to hire um, from our workforce, and that's just because the jobs aren't there. So they're willing they, they're they're willing to pay more for jobs um, to to get the employment in there. So that all kind of has happened at once. Plus, you have now um, you know increasing demand for for oil and gas all kind of put together. So it, it is kind of creating the perfect storm. Uh, as a trade association, we're working very hard to combat that. And the ways that we're looking to combat it are, number one, talking to folks like you who are talking to young people who are interested in the energy industry. Tell them, hey, there's going to be an opportunity here. Um, there's going to be a great opportunity here. Uh, come into the industry. We're doing that. We're doing job fairs. Um, but we're also you know, really working to help um, you know, as far as discussing with the media and, 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 and other folks to really tell the story of our, of our sector, um, so that a positive side of the energy industry gets out there. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, these, these folks are critical workers. I and mean, we learned that in the, in the pandemic, um, they never, they never went home. They, ne they never got to go home and sit on zoom, uh, you know, like we are now and, and do their work. You know, these folks were out in the field working they're in the in the factories manufacturing and if, if the reason why is because they knew that if they shut down the the country would shut down so, um so we we want to remind remind people like hey this is a, this is a really important part of the, of the of the economy and of our country's national security so um it's really those ways that we want to combat that talent issue uh, is is tell the story of this of this sector and, and and quite frankly the most important thing is to bring young people you know continue to bring young people back into the industry um and and really show them that it's a viable career option that can provide them a long-term career and it's not you know that it's not not a short-term thing it's something that can they can really build a career out of that's that's what the story we want to tell exactly yeah. and i think this this um like this discussion also will uh, will target many students and like this is uh, a great topic for them talent is very important they need to uh, like diversify their skills not only in the technical side but maybe on other uh, sites um, especially now uh, topics like hydrogen as you mentioned geothermal ccs are also important Top, uh, current, uh, companies are looking for maybe fresh graduates or young professionals who are familiar with these topics so that they can work with them and like start introducing these technologies into the companies. So that's why it's really important for, for engineers, for students, for other uh, types of energy professionals uh, to learn and to elevate also their skills. So skills and talent are very important here. Um, one fun fact about the oil and gas industry is that uh, we've been criticized, but uh, as the criticism that we are witnessing right now, there hasn't been anything so and this is mainly because of the climate change uh, we have a lot of um, environmentalists who are uh, maybe asking to ban the oil and gas industry to stop uh, hydraulic fracturing to stop uh, producing oil because they think that oil is against the environment we are destroying the planet so based on your opinion and your knowledge do you think there is a lack of communication from the oil and gas industry side? What can the oil and gas companies do here in order to promote uh, for themselves in terms of energy security, energy sustainability, um, that energy matters? The title of this uh, podcast is Energy Matters because it really matters. Uh, you mentioned about communities in Asia, in Africa, that they want energy and the demand will increase. So how can the oil and gas industry advocate for this? I know your association is working hard in order to advocate and to be like the real ambassadors for the oil and gas industry. But companies like operators, service companies, what they can do in order to uh, like promote themselves, promote the activities that they are doing and how critical... Um, the role that they are doing, especially for example, during pandemic, you mentioned about the oil and gas workers who are who were just like in the field doing their job. Also during the winter storm that hit Texas like two years ago, 
So everything was shut. Um, the wind, uh, the windmills, uh, the solar panels, nothing was working. We were mm-hmm. only depending on um, like the energy or the, the electricity that we are getting from oil and gas. So what is a recommendation that you have for oil and gas company or what they have to do in order to promote more for activities uh, that they are doing? Great, great question. There's a lot there. Let, let me let me let me unpack it. So, to your point about the winter storm, yeah, very true. It was, it, it, you know, everything went down, but the the natural gas fired facilities came back online much quicker, and we're able to get you know get get us back on our feet. Um, I think the the couple points. First point is you're 100 right. The oil and gas industry has has not necessarily always been its best advocate. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Probably too many to speculate right now, but um, we can do better. We need to do better. I think one of the things we need to do is we should never apologize for what we do, what, for what the men and women in the oil and gas industry do for this country. Never apologize. In fact, um, if you look, there, there's there's a, a government agency, EIA, which which keeps track of a lot of energy data. They're, they're nonpartisan, non-biased. Um, you know, it's a completely non-political entity. And they went back and looked and said, okay, why why has the U.S. lowered its carbon emissions more than any other country since 2005? And they did a big analysis. And that analysis came up with the fact that the reason why we've lowered our carbon emissions the most than any other country since 2005 is because we've transitioned many old coal-fired power plants to natural gas. Mm-hmm. That's That's undisputed. Doesn't mean that 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 you know solar and wind coming online has also helped, and that's great. But it, it, it that you know they looked at it and they said it's really that transition from coal to natural gas fired power plants that have have made the greatest impact. So that's an example uh, where you know the oil and gas industry is lowering emission. Um, there's more we can do. We're constantly coming up with new technology to detect methane leaks, uh, find out where they are, and fix them. You know, there's more we can do. We can learn. We can limit flaring. Um, our companies are working on ways to uh, frack in, that is cleaner um, in, for the environment. They've created the technology for e-frack, uh, which is much cleaner for the environment than than running the, the old diesel engines. So we're constantly improving. We think we can do better, and we need to continue to do better. We need to produce oil and gas. Uh, as clean and as uh, cost effective as we can. And we do that here in the United States. You know, we, we, we produce some of the cleanest oil and gas of anywhere, anywhere in the world. We need to keep doing that. Uh, and we also need to keep investing in new technologies. And, um, you know, the, the companies that we represent, they use uh, a lot of the revenue that they create, you know, through traditional oil and gas operations to invest in new technology. For example, Halliburton, well, our, one of our biggest companies, they created what's called Halliburton Labs, and it's right here. It's here in Houston. It's a it is a incubator for new technologies where they fund companies that have that 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 have come up with an idea, something in the energy space that is going to either improve something we're doing or maybe a brand new technology that's you know maybe maybe nobody's done it before. Uh, they fund them, they seed them, and they let them do their thing. And if if the company wants to go off and, and and spin off and create their own company, they let them do it. Or you know, the, if 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 the company wants to get invested in you know from from Halliburton, then they they'll, they'll do it that way. That's a great that's a great thing that and I don't think the general public realizes that. Um, you know, and then and some of the general public also wouldn't realize that you know the, some of the leaders and things like geothermal are what used to be traditionally oil and gas companies. I mean, if you if you if you're going to drill into the into the into the earth. Well, who is better to do it than a company like Halliburton or Baker Hughes that has been um, that been doing this for you know for decades for, for in some cases hundred hundred years, sure. um, so and the, and the engineers you know and that's also the story we need to tell better is the men and women that work at these companies that the the expertise they have is truly a national treasure. I mean the 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 technologies they've created and the knowledge that they have. They're going to be the ones that lead us to, um, you know, whatever the future of energy looks like. It's going to be those those men and women, um, and and we need to we need to cherish what they've done already and what they can do in the future, um, and and really tell that story to the American public and to you know uh, regulators and and politicians. All right, perfect. Yeah, this is really really good, and hopefully, like there will be more communication and. Um, 
the public will know uh, what are the efforts that are done from the oil and gas company's side in order to uh, work on maybe improving the image at the, at the same time achieving uh, net zero emissions that we are targeting right now. So since we are talking about net zero emissions and low carbon future, so what do you think uh, will be the future of the oil and gas industry achieving net zero emissions? Uh, of course, you mentioned that oil and gas companies are going to be a big part of achieving this because most of the emissions um, are coming from oil and gas, right? Uh, of course, there are other industries like the cement industry, um, power plants, they are contributing to the emissions. But for example, here in Texas, oil and gas is like playing a role, uh, a bit like a big impact in terms of the emissions. So how can the oil and gas com companies play a role? Especially here, I'm, I'm going to focus more on the carbon capture and storage. It's a really important technology. And who's better than petroleum engineers and petroleum geologists and oil and gas companies in order to address this topic and to innovate, um, get the expertise and the knowledge in order to capture the CO2 from the atmosphere and dump it down in depleted oil and gas reservoirs or in aquifers that are very deep and make sure that this CO2 is trapped underground for a long period of time. So what's your thought on achieving net zero emissions, especially from the oil and gas side? Yeah, great question. So I, I think um, you, hit, you hit the nail right on there. I think carbon capture will be a huge part of, achieve, of moving towards net zero. We're really bullish on, on carbon capture, as are many of our companies. Um, the biggest hurdles that we have seen as we talk to our companies that are in that space have been financing. Exactly. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act helps a great deal with that. Mm -hmm. There's a provision there, 45Q, which provides significant amount uh, of credit for carbon capture activities, enough so that you can go out and get financing for these projects now. So I won't say that the financing has been entirely fixed by the Inflation Reduction Act, but it helps a lot. The next piece of this, and this is incredibly important, is we are going to need permitting reform in the United States, both at the federal and local level, um, in order to really get carbon capture off the ground. Right now, in order to inject carbon down in the ground, you need what's called a class six permit. It's, it's uh, it, it, for the most part, the EPA handles these. And for whatever reason, the division of the EPA that is responsible for giving out these permits is taking years to get their permit. Sometimes it's almost four years. So companies can't go out and get financing, even if they have this cre tax credit coming at them, because they're gonna say, well, when are you gonna get your permit? And um, the answer is we don't know. You know, it could be it could be four years. So that's a huge problem right now for carbon capture. The good news is that there was some money in the IRA to to go to the EPA to speed up this permitting. We haven't quite seen it, you know, happen yet, but we hope that it will. And also, what we're seeing is we've seen some states, Texas uh, and Louisiana, being the most prominent that have applied to get what's called primacy for these class six inj injection wells. Yes. If they were granted primacy, it would mean that, um, in, for example, in the, in the state of Texas, the Railroad Commission would then be responsible for giving out these permits. Generally speaking, I think that's a good thing. I think the, the handling at the state level would probably be faster, mm -hmm. and states are going to be more familiar with their own geography and their own um, uh, you know, situation then they can hopefully get these out much quicker. So as soon as we fix that permitting, and there's also the possibility that we see a permitting uh, reform package that passes Congress that could also speed up a lot of these permitting so that could maybe cut the NEPA process down by a few years. All of this is important um, because to build out a, a nationwide carbon capture um, system, the way that we really could do it and should do it, you're going to need a lot of pipe, right? You're going to have to move you have to move a lot of this carbon around. Exactly. And right now, I mean, it's it's virtually impossible to even get a natural gas pipeline built in a lot of in a lot of places, especially in the Northeast. Um, you know, even even in other places in the in the United States, it can take up to four or five years. Um, that's that's not going to work if we're going to build out a nationwide you know uh, pipe system for for carbon capture. Um, we're going to need to build. You know, I've, I've seen estimates up to um, 60,000 miles of pipe just to get a basic system going. Um, so that's significant. And we're going to need a lot of permits for that. 
And um, if we if we don't do it, it's going to be a huge missed opportunity um, for the United States because our our you know our, our our allies and our friends in places like Europe they're already starting to look at this and and try to and try to build up these systems. And we don't want to we don't want to we don't want to come in second place. We got to come in first place because it's it's incredibly important. So uh, I, we're really out there advocating for permitting reform. Um, you know, both in the House and the Senate. Um, we saw an effort, uh, especially in the Senate side, led by Senator Manchin at the end of last Congress. He didn't couldn't get that over the finish line, but we we do have another effort again this this Congress. So we do hope that gets through, because uh, I I mean I am incredibly bullish on on carbon capture if we can get those two pieces lined up. We've already got the financing with the Inflation Reduction Act. If we can just get that permitting side lined up, I think uh, I think we'll see just a. Uh, a huge influx of capital and investment into that technology, which is great for everybody because carbon capture ultimately would would allow us to keep much of our infrastructure or oil and gas infrastructure, but would significantly lower the carbon um, the carbon impact of that. Um, so it's good for everybody. It allows us to use a, a domestic resource, continue to produce it, and to uh, at the same time dramatically you know lower the carbon impact. So it's it's kind of a win win for everybody, in my opinion. Exactly, that's really true. Carbon capture, I think, will play a big role in the future. And here in Texas, I think uh, lately uh, there was a project that um, got a really big fund from the Department of Energy in order to start uh, capturing the CO2, of course, after getting the class six permit, which is like the big thing here. But hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, like this, the, like the process in order to get the permit will be uh, much easier in the future so that we can really start injecting the CO2 underground for capturing for like uh, storing permanently purposes so yeah thank you for focusing on the ira it was one of the questions that i prepared but yeah you already mentioned all of uh, the benefits and the challenges regarding the inflation reduction act um i was navigating uh, the awtc website and i saw um, an article uh, that uh, you talked on it more about the lng and uh, like some of the endorsement maybe uh, from the Department of Energy. So could you please tell us more about this endorsement? The article was a new natural gas designation. Uh, this was like the topic. Uh, so how LNG will play a role in the energy mix or in the energy evolution? And what's the uh, challenges that we have maybe like in terms of economics, in terms of pipelines. So what's what's your opinion on the importance of LNG for the future of energy in the United States? Yeah, um, I think I think again, we're really bullish on LNG. it's It's funny though, because the you know the 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 concerns and the issues we have are very similar with LNG as as they are with building out a nationwide carbon capture system. We, have got to build more pipeline in the United States. We've got to build more export facilities um, for LNG. We've got to get them permitted. <clears throat> there's a there's a long wait for for permits. It was a huge uh, you know a, a very a significant slowdown um, at the beginning of this administration. We need to get more permits for the export facilities. But equally as important, we need to get more pipelines built to get the product to the LNG export facilities. Um, we don't have that necessarily. And especially when you, you know, in, we're blessed in Texas where we do have the infrastructure. We do see some gas that gets trapped out in Midland occasionally, um, or they have to wait, wait to get space to get out of there. But it's not as big a problem as it is up in the Northeast. I mean, get, getting gas out of the Marcellus shale is very difficult. Getting it out to an export facility is very difficult. There was a proposal for an export facility in Maryland that could have taken some of that. It, it's been going on for years. You know, so there's a lot of problem with, with that, but we we need to build out that infrastructure because we don't think the demand for U.S. LNG is going anywhere. Um, so we need to be able to get that product to to an export facility and out. Same problem on the West Coast. There's been um, you know proposals to have um, additional LNG export facilities on the West Coast that could get the product to Asia. Um, I think it was Jordan Cove in in Oregon. Has been a long-standing proposal. Um, it's very difficult to get those through. There's local opposition, so you know now um, there's 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 a, a project in Mexico on the west coast that would export LNG. So there there's all these people in the marketplace that are trying to fill fill that demand 
and and uh, respond to that demand increase that I think is going to continue. Um, you know, we have competitors abroad that are, you know, shipping LNG as well. So we need to make sure that we have the ability to, to fill these contracts just like our competitors do. Otherwise, we'll get, you know, our market share will get will eventually, you know, decrease. So, um, like I said, we're very bullish about long term um, LNG export. Um, export demand however at the same time we we got to build out the infrastructure to support that demand if we if we don't do it uh eventually we won't be able to meet that demand so that's that's why we're out there advocating for things like permitting reform um and ultimately it's good for the u.s worker it's good for the u.s economy if 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 we're the ones exporting our our product those are those are going to be you know americans that are going to work to to produce that and to refine it and to to you know, work at the at the export facilities that all brings the money back to to, the, to our economy in the United States, which is a good thing for for everybody. Um, so we're going to keep telling that story and advocating for you know the steps that we need to take as a country to support the ability to keep doing that and grow and growing the market. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, LNG is an important uh, part of the energy as well, energy mix, and. Um, it ensures that we have uh, reduced emissions uh, in terms of like low carbon uh, profile that we are targeting. Uh, we are almost near the end of the podcast today. The time flies quickly, but it's really a great conversation. So if you want to go just for final remarks, uh, the majority of our audience will be students who are studying petroleum engineering, uh, mainly at Texas A&M University or mm -hmm. at other universities worldwide, because this is going to be a public uh, podcast. So what's your advice for uh, <laughs> future petroleum engineers, the future energy engineers? You mentioned about talent. You mentioned about skills. Uh, what do they really need in order to ensure that they will get a job first in an oil and gas company and to sustain this job for the future? Right. So first thing I'll say is, is I've had the pleasure, you know, in the past five years of working with a lot of engineers in the oil and gas space, and they're all excellent people who really enjoy their job and are really passionate about it. And they're very bullish on the future of, of the industry. So um, I, I've really enjoyed getting to, getting to know them, and you know it's been one of the things I've I've uh, I've liked the most about this this opportunity. Um, I will say this: energy demand is is growing. It is a critical, as we talked about earlier, it's a critical part of our um, of our economy. It was, it, I mean, it's as simple as it keeps the lights on. I mean, it keeps us warm. I mean. Don't ever for don't ever forget how important the work that you do is to your friends, your neighbors. I mean, literally keeping the lights on. Um, so feel good about about the industry. Feel good about what you can do. Um, and you know, you will be you will be part of making um, the, the world of ten years from now, twenty years from now. I mean, the world we live in today is because of uh, of the energy industry. I mean. All of the things that we enjoy today is because of what people did 50, 60 years ago to build up this industry and really allow uh, the middle class around the world to grow. Um, I mean, imagine talking to our great grandparents um, about the world that we live in. And a lot of what we what, what we have now is because of, the, of this industry. So don't forget that. And certainly, you know, if you're talking to your friends who maybe are choosing, um, you know, choosing a different career path, that's great. But don't apologize for what, um, you know, what this industry does. I mean, it, it is incredibly important and really feel good about the opportunities that you're going to have in this in this sector. Um, our companies are all very bullish. They're all hiring. I'll tell you that <laughs> um, you you can you can, you know, shop around and you'll get you know, you'll get offers from from different companies. And, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, but they're looking you know, they are all they're all hiring now. And, and these are exciting jobs right it's not they're they're they're, they're going to be learning the people that take those jobs are going to be out learning new about new technologies like carbon capture you know geothermal hydrogen they're going to be doing that along along with traditional oil and gas and the skills that they they're going to learn are going to be tran transmit um are going to be able to be used you know for decades to come so just remember all that and it's an exciting industry and it's it's an important one and um I think that would be my 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 final parting words on that on that question. But it's important because we need more young people. So please, <laughs> please 
please come on board. All right. Thank you so much. I really like your statement. Don't apologize uh, what you're doing. Yeah. It's really like, I think this is like the headline of our podcast today because we are really doing students, uh, young professionals, experts, executives, and like, of course, uh, people like you are doing a great job in our industry. And we will continue to do a great job in delivering energy to our communities and achieving uh, this balance that we are aiming to. Of course, energy matters and environment matters. So we'll try to achieve this balance and by continuing education, um, innovation, um, investment in uh, new technologies such as uh, the hydrogen geothermal and CCS. So this is going to be a great uh, part of our job in the future. So thank you so much, Tim. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you today. Although it's virtual, but yeah, hopefully we'll have uh, like a future conversation in person. Thank you again uh, uh, for your time and for your effort uh, working at EWTC to advocate for our industry because people like you are like you are the icon and you are uh, like our leaders and we follow your steps uh, in order to reach our target because all of us care about uh, what we are doing and what we like what's the importance of our job in the future. So thank you again. Uh, if you have any final thoughts. Well, I really appreciate the conversation today. Um, this has been this has been great. Um, I, I would be happy to come back anytime and, and chat with you all. Uh, again, just appreciate what what you what you're doing, telling the story of, of, of the industry and and uh, communicating with young folks that are um, you know, training to, to join us. And uh, it, please reach out to us anytime. Anybody has questions about the industry or or anything that we can help with? Really, we're here. We're here for the whole the whole sector. We're here for folks that are just thinking about joining, or we're here for people that have worked um, for forty years in the in the industry. So we're here for everybody, and always use us as a resource if we can ever be helpful. And good luck to everybody in their careers. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for watching our podcast today. Hopefully, we'll see you in our next podcast. Stay tuned.